Hi, everyone. Um, as you guys start to join our program, I'll give it just a few seconds or so. Um, I just want to welcome you and thank you for being here with us. Um, the East Hampton Library wants to welcome uh, our National Park Ranger, Julie Flores. Thank you for being here with us. Um, thank you she me. will be giving us our talk about sharks. Uh, a few other things. If you have any questions for Julie during the program, you can throw it in the Q&A box down at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we will get to your questions at the end. Um, Julie will get to those questions in the last 10 minutes or so. Um, but I think that covers it for me. So thank you again for being with us, Julie. Yeah, of course. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Ranger Julie and uh, thank you for attending this program on shark skates and rays and a big thank you to the East Hampton Library for hosting this event for us. Um, it's really important that the National Park Service uh, connects with community partners to share messages of education and stewardship. And just to give you a little background on myself, um, I've been a park ranger for three seasons. So I usually work seasonally, like six months, you know, in the summer. I first got my start at um, Statue of Liberty National Monument and then did two consecutive seasons at Acadia National Park in Bar Harbor, Maine. Um, and right now, you know, Fire Island, I've actually um, have a one year position. Um, so that's very exciting. My background is actually in public history. A lot of people ask what public history is, they're unsure about it. So basically I am a historian who uses um, histor traditional historic methods to translate in information to the public in a more engaging way so that visitors, when they take one of my tours and programs, they walk away with a sense of relevancy, um, not necessarily that they learned the facts and the dates, um, because history is more than facts and dates, it's more um, narrative. But what's really great about working for the National Park Service is that I have the opportunity to uh, dip my feet into more natural resources, cultural resources, in addition to historical. So, um, so we'll go ahead and get started. So I'm sure many of you are already familiar with Fire Island and may have visited yourselves. Um, Fire Island National Seashore is uh, a unit of the national parks. So not all national parks are considered parks. There's actually only 63 national parks, but 421 national park units. Now these units are seashores. They're also recreation areas, heritage sites, national monuments, you know, and so on. But Fire Island National Seashore's marine ecosystem is a valuable resource for a variety of marine wildlife. Um, as they glide through water, sharks dive to the depths of the ocean and rise to the shallows. Sharks and their relatives, uh, skates and rays, are one of, Earth, um, one of Earth's prehistoric creatures and they've evolved and changed over the past 400 million years. They've actually survived several extinctions, including the dinosaurs. Um, these sea creatures are really unique from their hydrodynamic design, their reproduction, ecological role, and conservation. But most importantly, they're a keystone species, so they maintain the balance um, of the marine ecosystem. But what's unfortunate is that their biggest threat are people. Even if we find sharks threatening, we're actually, um, we're actually the threat to sharks. Um, there we go. So uh, shark skates and rays are a part of the elasmo branch family. It's a fish subclass and they're characterized as, um, as having cartilaginous uh, skeletons compared to bony fish. Um, cartilage, the same material, you know, our ears and our nose um, is pretty strong and dense but it's also not as heavy as bone. Um, and it's an advantage for weight reduction, making it easier to swim at faster speeds and pretty swiftly and more covertly. It's also um, lightweight and much more buoyant, which is pretty energy efficient. Now, um, unlike bony fish with the cartilaginous skeletons that elasmo branches have, um, Elasmo branches don't have scales. Um, kind of the most similar thing would be um, what they're called dermal denticles. If you see this picture on the right hand side, 
Um, these are the dermal denticles. They're more of a uh, flat, um, triangular, tooth-shaped skin. It feels a lot like sandpaper. It serves a hydrodynamic function, which reduces drag and friction. What's also really cool about it, um, it, acts, it actually acts like a chainmail armor uh, to protect against predators, as well as um, sort of bacterial growth or algae growth. And one thing that sharks are really well known for is uh, their teeth, um, which they have rows and rows of teeth that are shed and continually replaced, almost kind of like a little bit of a rotary. Now, um, cartilage doesn't fossilize well. So the cartilage's skeleton dissolves, completely decomposes, but the teeth are left behind. Um, what's really neat is that when they fall to the ocean floor, they get buried in the sand. And uh, silica and um, calcite from the sand preserves them. So that's why um, you know, a lot of scientists can, can find those um, shark teeth. Now, uh, skates and rays um, share many similarities, but the most obvious difference is gonna be their shape. Obviously, um, sharks are larger um, and have a more streamlined torpedo shape where rays are much smaller, um, you know, wider and have a flatter body. In addition to the characteristics that I had mentioned with the cartilage and the skeletons, the dermal denticles and the teeth, um, elasmo branches are characterized as having uh, four to seven gill slits. The openings filter ocean water to absorb oxygen. And the placement is different, um, which is pretty obvious. Um, so the gills are found on the sides of heads for sharks and on the underside for skates and rays. Um, I think it's really cute to have this uh, picture of this uh, skate <laughs> to see its beautiful smile there. They look like fun-loving creatures. Um, but sharks actually must, um, they have to keep swimming. Um, they have to co continuously swim to keep water to move across their gills in order to breathe. This is called ram ventilation um, compared to skates and rays who are able to, um, to sort of rest. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. So skates versus rays. As I mentioned, um, their shape, they're more dors uh, ventrally flattened, which makes them glide easily along the seafloor. Their shape allows them to swim very gracefully with undulating motions appearing to fly through water. I like to call them the UFOs of the deep sea. Now the difference in shape uh, between uh, rays and skates. Um, if you look at um, the skate on the right hand side, uh, skates are more round and um, more triangle shaped with shorter and thicker tails, while rays uh, more of a shape of a, of a kite with a thinner whip-like tail and some even have a, uh, a stinging spine. They also have a difference in teeth. Uh, skates have uh, small pointy teeth for biting while rays have serrated teeth for, for crushing. Um, and that is really helpful um, because they're bottom feeders since they, they cruise along the sea floor. They primarily feed on bottom, um, bottom dwelling animals that include crustaceans, snails, shrimp, clams, oysters, and small fish. So you can see why those serrated teeth would be really good for crushing those cell, uh, the shells. And then for protection, uh, skates and rays will bury themselves underneath the sand. Um, and again, compared to the ram ventilation that sharks have where they have to be constantly swimming, skates and rays have spiracles, which are identified um, on this picture in front of you now. Um, the, they're pretty much breathing holes located near, near the eyes, so they can bury themselves and still be able to breathe through those spir uh, spiracles. Now, elasmo branches have really cool acute senses. Um, the, there's the lateral line system, which is the picture on the right. Um, it extends along both sides of the body and is generally visible. 
Um, hopefully you can see it well enough on your screens, but if you follow these white lines, you can kind of see a little bit of the canal um, going on right here. Now, the, the lateral line system is sort of a barometer and almost a navigation system, a GPS for elasmo branches. Um, it receives physical stimuli from the environment allowing them to detect waves of pressure. Um, so any sort of disturbances, movement, um, and helps with, with the uh, direction, um, knowing the direction of any object or fish. Like I said, it acts as like a barometer. Now, the lateral line has a canal just underneath the skin with pore openings exploring, um, exposing what we call a neuromast, which is the actual sensory organ. Um, it's a little bit of a um, conical shape with hair-like filaments in, in bundles. Um, and the neuromast, when those like bundles are, are stimulated by movements, the nerves underneath carry signals to the brain, which interprets as a vibration resulting in a response. So they know whether to move one way or the other. The um, ampulla of Lorenzi, uh, Lorenzi is the um, scientist who discovered the sensory organ, is similar to the lateral line organ, but it's more, it's primarily sensitive to electrical fields rather than pressure. So this sensory organ is found on the head and snout so it's these little black dots that you see on the sharks. It almost looks like blackheads on a person's face. Um, so it's found on the head and snout and detects electrical impulses generated by muscle contractions of, of nearby creatures. They only really work at close range, which is more helpful for fine, like for final attacks when they're kind of going in for the kill, as you would say or finding fish that bury themselves in the sand, which would be skates and rays. Um, and the ampulla works similarly, similarly to the lateral line system with that network of pores um, and neural mass, those sensory organs. Um, but again, it's electrical in impulses. So there's sort of a jelly-like chamber where those um, nerve endings are with semiconductive properties to send information to the brain. So it's really neat to see um, the senses of, of these creatures. And they also have um, um, great, I, they have poor eyesight, but just kind of how their eyes are kind of set up, they're able to see contrasts really well. Um, they can see in very low light conditions, which makes a lot of sense. They have a great sense of smell as well. Now, when it comes to reproduction, there are several ways uh, shark skates and rays reproduce, but there are sort of three primary ways. So if you look at this picture on the left, which describes um, reproduction, we can start with um, viviparous. I believe I'm pronouncing that right. I, I, <laughs> it's, it, it's, a, it's a lot. <laughs> viviparous, um, which is, just like how, how mammals reproduce. There's a placental link. The, the young develop inside their mother and are born live. So this is the primary method of reproduction for rays and most uh, native Long Island sharks. So sharks um, that reproduce in this way usually only have a few at a time and are often uh, abandoned after birth. Then we have oviparous, um, which is giving birth to offspring by laying eggs, um, usually in a hidden area. And this is the primary method for skates. So that's another difference between skates and rays, where um, rays give live birth and skates um, lay eggs. Now, uh, you might be wondering what these creepy little alien-like satellite things <laughs> are on this right-hand uh, side of the presentation here. Those are called um, mermaid purses. Um, it's basically the skate egg case. Um, so that little bump there in the middle is, is an embryo. So the mermaid's purse is a protective case for the embryo that makes it difficult for predator, uh, predators to get into them even if they do find them. 
And uh, skate egg cases are pretty small, only about three to four inches long. They're uh, leathery, um, rectangular shape, as you can see, with uh, long corn-like projections sticking out from each corner. Um, the egg casers are made of keratin, so it's the same substance as our fingernails um, and our hair. And the long curved like projections on each corner of the egg case are covered with a gummy material. And the horns tend to catch on the seaweed or other objects which help anchor the, uh, the egg case to the bottom of the ocean floor. So it's really cool to see evolutionary how you know these mermaid purses adapted in order you know to, to survive. What's really neat about the mermaid purse is that you can find them dried up on the beach, usually along the rack line. Um, and the rack line is the point on the beach where the highest tide hits the shore. Um, the third um, reproduction method is ovoviviparous. <laughs> which uh, most sharks use this method of uh, reproduction in which um, eggs incubate and hatch inside the mother's body and the pups are born live. So there's no placental link here. The embryo just develops inside the egg. Um, the pups get nutrients from the yolk and emerges from the egg while inside the mother who then gives the, the live birth. Lastly, we have um, Parthoingenesis, um, which is reproduction without the need for male sperm, which is basically asexual reproduction. So there have been cases where female sharks in captivity have had no contact with male uh, with the male, but become pregnant. So this means that asexual reproduction is a possibility with some types of sharks. And this could be a significant reason why they've been able to evolve so easily and to continue with high population numbers. However, it is believed that asexual reproduction doesn't take place too often in the natural environment, unless there's some sort of stress in the population of sharks, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Uh, this is due to the lack of abundance of both males and females out there um, to successfully mate with. Um, but asexual reproduction helps build defenses against threats to other species. Now, uh, here's a list of sharks of Long Island. So we have the basking shark, blue shark, common thresher shark, dusky shark, sand tiger shark, sandbar shark, short fin mako, Smooth hammerhead shark, white shark, smooth dogfish, and uh, spiny dogfish. Now, shark attacks. <laughs> so you know the scene. Jaws is a very familiar movie to a lot of people. A woman's legs kicking underwater, a black mass slowly rising from the depths, a triangular fin slicing through the water. For many, it's that time of year when Jaws is on the mind. Um, I can say that every single year since I was a child, my first time at the beach at the summer, I was always nervous to go in the water. It always takes me a little while to get used to going into those, those depths. Um, but then once I'm in, I feel pretty comfortable. Never, never seen a shark before and hope maybe not to. But, um, but there's actually only been 10 cases of shark bites on humans documented on New York beaches since the 19th century. And the last one on Fire Island was in 2018. But the chances of being attacked by a shark are less than being struck by lightning. Out of the 500 species of shark, only a dozen are potentially dangerous to humans, um, which is the great white shark, tiger shark, and bull shark. Um, the great white and tiger shark um, as I mentioned, is native to Long Island. But the thing is, is that humans aren't their preferable prey. Sharks are actually a greater danger to other sharks than humans are. So for example, we were just talking about reproduction. Uh, sand tiger sharks will devour their own siblings in the womb or eat unfertilized eggs, um, which is called um, embryonic cannibalism. Shark attacks occur um, near, near shore in sandbars or in between sandbars, 
when sharks can get trapped during low tide. Also, sharks congregate in deeper areas because their prey group there. And humans are actually the cause for more common shark attacks because of coastal development, tourism, and pollution. Humans interfere with shark habitats. The destruction of their habitat has four sharks closer to land, thus closer to humans. So when it, when it comes to shark safety, be cautious, not fearful. Again, there we're not, you know, we're not their first choice. We're not their first choice for meals. So to minimize the chance of a shark attack, you want to keep these things in mind. Um, weather. Um, incoming storms stir up bait fish. So avoid getting in the way of sharks prey um, by avoiding water after storms. They say like even 24, afters, uh, 24 hours after a storm. Also time of day, dawn and dusk. And as far as activity, swimming in groups um, is a lot better than swimming alone. And of course, um, staying close to shore. Don't go in the water if you're actively bleeding from a wound, since sharks do have a very acute sense of smell. Wearing jewelry or any sort of shiny objects um, can be reflected in the light and resemble like fish scales. And avoiding brightly colored swimwear because sharks can see contrast pretty well. Um, so why are sharks important? They play an extremely critical role in marine ecosystems and help maintain healthy oceans. As an apex predator, sharks keep the population of species at healthy levels. And you know, monitoring sharks can you know, indicate fluctuations in ecosystem. So as a keystone species, they serve as an indicator for ocean health, most importantly. They remove sick or weak prey, um, in addition to regulating species abundance, uh, distribution, and diversity. They also indirectly maintain seagrass and coral reef habitats, um, which deters other species like crustaceans, other fish, turtles, and manatees from overgrazing those areas. And as I mentioned before, um, humans, um, humans have had a really large impact on, on shark populations. Um, threats facing sharks are exclusive to human impact and the activities that we do. Um, there are about 400 species of shark that are considered threatened, um, and they've been hunted down to about 90%, which is a really discouraging number to hear. Um, and this human impact is caused by overfishing, which is the biggest threat to sharks, um, which is fueled by a high demand for shark products. Um, shark fin soup um, specifically hurts the population really terribly. Um, it's an Asian delicacy. So when the sharks are ca uh, caught for shark fin soup, um, they're caught live and their dorsal fins are removed while the rest of the shark goes to waste. So for many instances, when you know, the, the sharks are caught and their dorsal fins are cut off, they're, they're thrown back um, alive and left helpless on the ocean floor because they have no way to move. Uh, this is called shark finning. And you can see in that middle picture there, um, a fisher folk is um, removing that dorsal fin. Um, bycatch also is the unintentional capture of fish by fisheries. Uh, sharks will get entangled in troublesome fishing equipment. Um, some equipment includes um, longline fishing, which has thousands of hook from a line that's miles long. Um, skates and rays are uh, particularly susceptible to trawls, um, which are large nets, and it's almost in, like invisible netting, so they can't even see, so they get caught and, and tangled in those. Um, habitat um, degradation as well, um, and that's from the effects of climate change and pollution, which is a very hot topic issue uh, facing us today. The ocean absorbs carbon, making the water more acidic. 
So in addition to, in addition to warming oceans, um, I'm sorry, in addition, warming oceans shift prey to cooler waters and sharks have to follow. So phytoplankton, which is the basis of the marine food web, thrives in cold water. So if water warms, there's less food for the animals, resulting in, in more competition. Um, microplastics um, is a real big issue as well. Um, it's plastic debris that breaks down through you know, wave action and UV breakdown into tiny particles, almost microscopic, that get ingested or inhaled through gills. And microplastics are bioaccumulators. So the microplastics affects their primary food source, um, dependent on prey that consumes on other species at lower trophic levels. So if you know, microplastics affect a crustacean where it accumulates in their system and then a skate or a ray eats that um, crustacean and then a, a shark will eat that um, ray. It just accumulates over time. Now, biological limitations and de degradation um, in, in the population, they, um, shark skates and rays are slow growing and pretty late to mature. And it's unfortunate because many sharks are killed before they're even sexually mature or have even produced offspring. They also have long pregnancies, which can last up to nine to 12 months um, in certain species of sharks even longer than that. They produce few young, um, which varies from two pups or maybe over to a hundred, but this is pretty minuscule compared to bony fish, which release millions of eggs. Plus, they may not reproduce every year, um, where some species have a resting period of about one to two years. Now, um, what's, doing, uh, what's being done about these threats? So for shark conservation, you've got the, um, your, um, the NOAA fisheries. So the fisheries management plan of 1993 uh, started listing certain species um, as endangered or threatened under the Endangered Species Act. There is also the Shark Conservation Act of 2010, which helps manage commercial and recreation shark fisheries in the ocean and works with regional fishery management councils to conserve um, and sustainably manage sharks in the ocean. What they do is conduct research, assess stocks, um, work with fisher folk, and implement restrictions on shark harvests. So there have been, uh, there has been some significant process toward ending overfishing and um, rebuilding over fish stocks for long-term sustainability. Um, we also have the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora which uh, increased protection for commercially exploited sharks and rays, and Atlantic States uh, Marine Fisheries Commission, which is a coastwide management of sharks in state waters. So what can we do to conserve sharks? Um, educating yourself, number one, which you're already doing by attending this program. Um, by educating yourself on the issues, you can find effective ways to help. Um, you can also teach others about sharks and inspire them to get involved as well. Um, don't use shark products. Um, I don't think that shark meat is very popular here on Long Island or maybe in the United States, um, but shark cartilage and oils are found in a range of prod, uh, products from beauty items to you know, health nutrition. So jewelry, cosmetics, supplements, lotion, facial cleanser, um, shark liver oil, also called squalene. So before consuming any products, make sure it doesn't use any shark materials Excuse me. And by uh, boycott, uh, boycotting shark products, you will reduce market demand, causing companies killing sharks to make these products. Um, reduce seafood consumption. Um, as I mentioned before, commercial uh, fishing really negatively impacts sharks, as well as um, recycling to reduce the amount of microplastics that go into the ocean. 
one way that you can really get, you know, sort of hands-on involved is to become a citizen scientist. Um, a citizen scientist is a, a volunteer, just a member of the general public who observes um, or collects data as a part of a larger collaborative project um, with professional scientists. So if you've spotted a shark in New York, you can report sightings to the New York Department of Environmental uh, Conservation. And you can learn more on their website at on.ny.gov slash sharks. Um, this is a pretty neat picture <laughs> that I found on Instagram from Fire Island and Beyond. Davis Park, I'm not sure when uh, this picture was taken, but it's pretty neat to see, especially from up above. Um, so though Fire Island is a major destination spot for many people, um, we have to remind ourselves that Fire Island's seashore is home to shark skates and rays and more magnificent sea creatures. Um, by educating ourselves on the importance of marine ecosystems, we can better appreciate the seashore's natural wonders and can act as and can act as stewards to protect Fire Island and all its inhabitants. Although sharks seem and feel like a threat to humans, humans are the number one threat to sharks. We are alive in the same way that these marine creatures are alive. And hopefully after this program, you have a deeper connection and understanding of shark skates and rays. Um, and I encourage everyone to explore the outdoors adventurely and respectfully. So thank you so much. Um, if you have any questions, um, we can open it up to discussion or... Thank you so much, Julie. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, if anyone had questions, you can put it in our Q&A box um, or your chat box. I'll, I'll look in either spot. Uh, and we'll wait a few minutes and see if we get any questions. But um, I want to thank Julie for being here and for kind of bringing the message of conservation um, to, to the people of Long Island, although I, Roger joined us from the UK. So thanks for joining us, Roger. <laughs> so, that's always fun to get someone from out of town. Um, yeah. But we'll wait a few minutes and see if we get questions. Um, uh, but otherwise, thanks again. Yeah, no, thank you. This was, this was fantastic. <laughs> All right, well, um, if nobody has any questions, uh, like I said, thank you again for joining us. Um, and, oh, I'm so sorry, hold on one second. <laughs> Wendy wanted to know what might have caused the recent death of a diving, maybe that was cut off, uh, potentially a diver. Hmm, not, not sure. Uh, if uh, a diving instructor by a shark, what might have caused the recent death of a diving instructor by a shark? Um, I'm not sure if that's a specific instance you're talking about or just in general. Um, um, that's a great question. Um, we can never be inside the minds of, of wildlife. And it maybe could have been caused by a variety of reasons. The first thing that comes to mind is harassment. Um, although, you know, as I mentioned that we're not, you know, particularly on the menu for sharks, um, obviously, you know, shark attacks have happened. Um, harassment, I think is like the number one thing. So if, you know, the diver may have gotten too close to the shark and again, that lateral line, you know, the shark knew that there was something coming close by, maybe it felt threatened, maybe it tried to move and the diver got closer. Um, when sharks do approach someone, someone can get, you know, they, they want to respond, they want to get away. So I've, I've read that in instances, people will punch a shark kind of right in the snout. And as I mentioned, that ampulla of Lorenzi, all those sensories is really good for final attack. So if, if someone were to punch a shark right in the nose, of course, they're going to respond. Um, so I would say harassment would be um, a reason why that sharks would kind of engage in more violent activity. 
I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Um, another question we got is, what is the most common type of shark uh, found on Long Island? I believe it's the dogfish. I believe it's the dogfish. Okay, I think we've gotten to our questions then. Thank you guys for your questions. Um, thank you again, Julie, for being here. And we hope you all have a great night. Thanks for joining us. Great. Thank you so much, Allison. Really appreciate it. Have a good night, everyone. Good night.